Hey, I'm Jeffrey Rickman, and this is my channel, Plain Spoken. Uh, from time to time, I review content that um, impacts the United Methodist Church. I've reviewed a number of articles. I haven't done a lot of video because it's just more editing and I'm lazy. But um, on March 2nd, Bishop Bickerton uh, released a, uh, a pre-taped uh, State of the Church address that I found really indicative of a number of things that... Um, or I don't know, salient might be a better word. There are just a number of things that really stuck out as important in understanding the course of the United Methodist Church, where we're going, um, what what to be aware of. And as a conservative, um, there are a number of things that I found concerning or worthy of note. And so I, I thought I would put together a video, and this is it, where um, anyone who's interested can look at some of these things with me and see how I'm processing them, and maybe I can receive some correction. Maybe I'm being um, uncharitable in the way that I, I see some things. Um, but maybe a lot of people watch this and, and didn't catch some of the signals for the hostility that is already here and, and seems uh, dead set on continuing. The thing I'll say on the front end of this is um, I'm not interested in questioning people's motives or character. And I don't think it's really helpful to do anything like, I can't believe someone would say X, Y, or Z. Um, so I, I don't like the emotional anxiety, and I, I, I try not to replicate that. But the, the thing that I am going to say on the front end is Bishop Bickerton's presentation indicated to me that he does not understand or care to understand conservative evangelical traditional voices, voices um, or the, the caucuses that represent us. And so I, I'll, uh, I'll play some clips from this, this presentation that I put together to, to try and flesh out why I think that. And of course, I understand that there is such a thing as deceptive video editing, and I, I try not to, to do that. But of course, the only way to get the full impression of what the bishop said is to watch his actual address. And so I'm going to urge you to do that if you, if you want to make sure that you have a, a perfect opinion on it, then go ahead and hear my remarks, but um, listen to the bishop's full remarks, because I don't want to do this. I watched it, so you don't have to type of thing. I, I'm not doing anything snide like that. I'm just trying to help people see the picture um, with with clear eyes. So um, if you don't know what I'm talking about, this uh, Heather Hahn wrote an article on the day of the release, Bishop, time for uh, to move from rancor to revival. Uh, you should see that in an overlay uh, right now, where she gives kind of a breakdown of all the content. She offers just a little bit of pushback um, uh, about, you know, kind of how the, and then there's a link to the the actual video, which is on YouTube. I haven't checked out how it's done. What happens if I go to YouTube? It's not going to take me there, is it? I'm just interested to see how many people have viewed it. Looks like United Methodist Videos has... Uh, how many subscribers? 19,000. And how many people have watched this? Three and a half, almost thousand views, which isn't bad, but um, uh, I've got videos that have seen more views than that, and I've got 70, no, how many? 740 subscribers, and thank you for subscribing. Feel free to subscribe to my channel. So I'm kind of confused by how few people have viewed this. I don't know why it is. I thought it was an excellent production. I thought it looked crisp and clear and professional. So often things that I look at that are generated by the United Methodist Church, uh, they're just clunky and kind of um, cringy. This this was really highly produced. Bishop Bickerton obviously rehearsed this. He crafted it. Um, he, he, he did an excellent job, The and it was beautiful. They got the right camera angles. They got the right audio. As someone who's tried to get into this I, I was very impressed with the job that they did. And then they've done a full court press on on promoting it. There were a, a couple different articles on the, I went to the Council of Bishops website here, and it had uh, an article here, it had an article here on it. And so they've, they've done their best to circulate it. So obviously this is a message, and I'm not going to pretend to know how many minds went into the creation of it. Almost certainly it was more than uh, Bishop Bickerton. But I, I, I don't know how many people went into making it what it was, but there was a clear, there were several clear messages in there, and it began with a, a personal uh, conversion experience story from the bishop, and I can't, I don't want to play the whole thing, but I mean, it was really touching. Um, here's, here's the takeaway uh, from one part. 
and gave me a sense of hope that I could not only believe in myself, but also be in relationship with others. And on a Thursday night, at the close of a sermon by a man named Cornelius Henderson, later Bishop Cornelius Henderson, I found myself kneeling at an altar and offering my life to Jesus Christ because at that moment I became convinced that the pathway of Christianity offered me the best chance ever to become what God had intended for me to be. In good old traditional language, it was a conversion. So that that followed a setup from him where he was describing that he grew up as a fat kid that was he was bullied severely and so uh he went to to church camp feeling abused and like he was going to get killed cuz that's what he knew was hostile children and instead he encountered this community of love and support and then what i wanted to highlight was the language he used there for conversion um he used the language of learning to trust himself it was all very self uh, referential language. He, he learned to trust himself, and he became convinced that Christianity was the best pathway for him personally to become who God made him to be. And the reason I focus on that is because uh, we find ourselves in a, a point in the history of the church where emotive language that, that deals with emotions carries a lot of currency with people, and then also very subjective language carries a lot of currency, in particular with, with liberal people. And so to, to convey that language, and I would highlight there's nothing about sin, there's nothing about depravity, there's nothing about recognizing that he is, uh, the, the classical term I think is homo curvatus, malformed, the image of God in him is, is malformed and in need of a, a rebirth, to be born again in Christ Jesus, any kind of regeneration. I, I don't lift that up, that contradistinction up to, 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 to judge Bishop Bickerton's conversion, only to say that the language that he employs is easily recognizable to people on the left, but is lacking a lot of components that people on the right would, would readily embrace and say, yes, that is a conversion experience that I myself uh, embrace and have experienced and have been blessed by. Um, so, so I think even from the beginning... What he's doing is is uh, something that liberal voices often do, and I'm not going to pretend to know Bishop Bickerton's personal theology, so I'm going to say certain things are emblematic of liberals or, or people on the left, but I don't want to infer that that's where Bishop Bickerton is because I don't know him, I, I haven't listened to him enough. I'm just going to say that signaling here is inoffensive to people on the left, whereas people on the right would already be kind of going, well, that's not exactly what I understood conversion to be. I want to relate to you. And, you know, I think it shows a lot of... I appreciate when uh, bishops can admit painful personal things from the past and and create a, a sense of shared empathy for the plight of kids that are bullied. But then it, it kind of goes a weird direction because he then directly interposes our current divide in the church onto that as a, a child. So he was dealt with bullying and, and coercion, and then he says that the conservative faction that is trying to help unhappy churches leave is now filling that role of a, a bullying, coercive entity that's, that's, that's bullying this poor fat kid, which is the United Methodist Church. And so I, I, I wanted to... Um, play this particular, uh, he, he really, there were two different sections where he really laid into conservatives, and I just wanted to, to see that for a second. I, I titled this uh, Diatribe Against Disaffiliating Conservatives. I hope that's a fair title. In the hallways of our church, we have allowed ourselves to be bullied by a narrative that has become a daily barrage of coercion, abuse, and ridicule that has evaporated a significant amount of spirit within us. It's created a significant amount of fatigue within us, and it has clearly diverted our attention away from the real reason we have this church in the first place. You see, we have been told that we're the enemy, that we're out to change the doctrine of the church, that we have not followed the gospel mandate, that we don't believe in Jesus, and that it's only a matter of time before we become a distant memory in the annals of time. 
Our church is splintering with certain congregations and leaders choosing to exercise a temporary disciplinary provision to disaffiliate and go either independent or to a newly emerging organization that values separation more than connection. The spirit is toxic. The attitude is confrontational. The method of invitation is filled with coercion and accusation. Words being spoken are vitriolic, mean-spirited, and often filled with falsehoods designed to make the other side appear to be the enemy, the problem, and the reason behind the everything that is wrong with the church today. All of this has led me to ask at times, why would anyone want to associate with this kind of behavior? And yet, people do. So those particular sections, that was two main sections that I clipped together, I found very concerning um, because I don't think it's an accurate or charitable characterization of real people. So the thing that he does in this presentation is he begins with a, uh, a bid for us to acknowledge his humanity. He tells us something vulnerable from his past that we can identify with, and that's good. But then what he does after that is immediately removes the humanity of those with whom he disagrees, or um, he, 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 he demonizes them. Essentially, he caricatures them as these two-dimensional beings bent on hate and destruction, and and the the at at every every turn his his language towards conservatives there's nothing fair like uh, these people have a different theological understanding that that causes them to behave in ways that are often perceived by people on the left as caustic there's nothing like that there is they value division more than unity um, that that would not be a way that they characterize themselves and I'll, I'll come back to that at the end we'll talk about unity. But um, he, he characterizes them as uh, coercive, and I, I put together all the time that he uses the word coercive because this was such an odd word choice, um, in my opinion. Um, this, is, this is much shorter. Coercion. Coercion, abuse, and ridicule. Coercive dynamic. Coercion and accusation. So he, he uses these words in the midst of describing conservatives uh, and, and equating them to the, the bully that, that was picking on him as a kid. And that's a problem because coercion is a word that means something, and it, it, uh, uh, it generally means using the force and power that one has to compel someone to behave in ways that, that they do not want to. So in this case, I am not at all clear how it is that he sees evangelicals as coercive, because so far as I understand, they're not in a position of any kind of power. They're not in position, uh, they're not controlling anything. They don't have the money, they don't have the institution, they don't have any of the levers of power. So how is it that they can be coercive? Meanwhile, he represents the institution that people like me would say is being coercive. They, they do not have to make things as difficult for unhappy congregations to leave as they do. Uh, and some, you know, I'm about to report on the Great Plains Annual Conference. That, that conference has been pretty good, has been pretty amicable. They've been able to keep the temperature down pretty low. But there have been a lot of bishops, a lot of conferences and cabinets that have done everything that they can to stand in the way of congregations that want to leave. And even in North Georgia, our biggest annual conference, they just straight up said, you can't leave because we don't like what you're saying. And that's a big part of what uh, Bishop Bickerton is, is really tapping into here, is he doesn't like what they are saying. And so he says that, that what they're saying is, is, is hateful, it's often deceptive and dishonest, and the thing I find upsetting about that is there are no names attached to this. And at, in my mind, you know, in just a local church, if someone is coming to me with a complaint but they don't have a name attached to it. They just have some people say, then I had to learn to say, I don't hear complaints without a name attached. And yet people at the top, for some reason, don't have that discernment where they understand a name and a specific needs to come with an allegation. He's painting with a very broad brush this whole slew, you know, millions of people who don't want to be disaffiliated, don't want to be affiliated with the United Methodist Church anymore, and saying that they're just hateful, that they're coercive, 
that they are uh, bigoted, that that they're just so nasty. He says the attitude is toxic. You know, he's he's characterizing everything that they're saying and doing and feeling. He's characterizing. He doesn't even call the Global Methodist Church a denomination. He calls it an organization that values division. You know, like everything is is so. I would characterize his words as caustic. When when you're dealing with people who see things differently, one of the things that you learn right off the bat, if you if you if you study this, is the Rogerian method, named after the guy who who uh, coined it. But the notion is that whenever you're going to disagree with someone, you need to be able to characterize what they believe and think in a way that they themselves recognize. And if you can't do that, if all you can do is straw man and demonize, then that's indicative that you're not listening. And so that's that's the thing that I'm going to bring to this is I really don't know that Bishop Bickerton has been listening. If he has been, then I think that this is calculated not to give a nuanced view that helps people understand the current tension. I think that this this was constructed in order to help people pick sides and get ready to fight. Um, remember, Bishop Bickerton has already gotten involved in the fight uh, just a month ago or so. He released that decision that nobody in the Philippines can disaffiliate under 2553. Uh, with an interpretation that didn't even get submitted to the Judicial Council. He just made it. It was kind of, I mean, I think you could describe it as a fiat. Um, this this is the head of the Council of Bishops who is not fond of disaffiliation, the things that have led up to it, or the things that it's going. And rather than have a good conversation about it, he wants to um, change the conversation. New conversation. I believe it's time for us in the United Methodist Church to have a new conversation. It's time for a new conversation, seizing control of the narrative that has spun out of control. So those, those were the, the short clips where I just thought, man, this is really, you know, when you're saying it's time for us to have a new conversation, really that, that seems like a polite way of saying, I don't like what you're saying. I want you to say something else. We're going to have a new conversation. But the thing is, whenever there is a long-standing dysfunctional problem and there's finally a fallout, we don't get to say, oh, no, 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 let's talk about something else. Like, this is something that's been decades in the making, and this is the unfolding. I, I don't like how it's happening. Nobody likes how it's happening, but we don't get to choose our circumstances. We just have to, to go through them as honorably and nobly as we can, and that's what the role of bishop is for. I would like for, for Episcopal leadership to be able to explain where the divide is and why it is and be able to validate what they can on both sides, to push back against falsehoods uh, with names and dates attached to them. You know, this is something that should be expected of mature adult leadership. And I, I, I'm, I'm thinking the only reason why we got this is to help us uh, pick sides and, and increase the tension between us. So um, something else, uh, he, he, it's not all negative. You know, there's a lot of positive in here. And one of the things that he did was that he lifted up the beloved community um, for a little bit. And so let's, let's look at the beloved community, because this figures largely into his view of what we should be doing. The phrase or idea of beloved community was first used in the late 19th and early 20th century by the philosopher theologian Josiah Royce as a part of his founding of the Fellowship of Reconciliation. It was then popularized by Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. during the height of the civil rights movement. As I researched this term further, I discovered that there were five defining characteristics of a beloved community. One, a shared desire to be peaceful, happy, and safe. Two, a recognition that while conflict still exists, it is resolved peacefully, nonviolently, and without hostility, ill will, or resentment. Three, in the beloved community, there is a recognition of the inherent worth and value of all people, animals, and ecosystems. Four, a beloved community is motivated by unconditional and all-inclusive kindness, compassion, and love for all of life. To that end, 
a beloved community works cooperatively to peacefully end hunger, prejudice, poverty, homelessness, environmental destruction, and violence and injustice of all kinds. And fifthly, in a beloved community, the means we use to create change are just as kind and compassionate as the ends we seek. So that's a beloved community. And it sounds nice. I mean, it clearly has some leftist language in there that that I don't think is volunteered by the Bible. But even so, you know, Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, was a big proponent of it, and um, I, I, I think it's probably a good thing to have in mind uh, for some people. But the problem is that the beloved community is not binding Methodist doctrine or discipline. It's just a, a vision cast by someone outside of the Methodist tent. Um, so that directly ties to the way he treats the discipline. He turns to the Book of Discipline, and um, he he says a couple of things that I just found. Uh, you know, part of me sympathizes with them, but also if if a bishop is saying these things, I've I've got a problem. So I, he says more than what I've got here, but I just I put together a couple clips. This Book of Discipline is a book of rules. This Book of Discipline is a book of conduct. This book of discipline is a result of legislation, but this book of discipline called Methodists to a lifestyle. The book that beginning in 1939 has become filled with rules and legislation. So he doesn't say flat out that he doesn't care to enforce the the book of discipline, but he does uh, characterize it uncharitably. Now, there was rules in the old book of discipline. He just doesn't highlight that. He, he highlights a part uh, that, that has language about unity that he likes. Uh, likewise, the, the modern discipline isn't all rules. It has a lot of good doctrine and theology in it, but he highlights the modern one uncharitably and the old one charitably, uh, with the inference being that our book of discipline really isn't good. You know, it, it's really not something that... Um, that should be lauded or that, that really we should be constrained to. Um, here's the, the vows that he took whenever he became a bishop that all bishops take. Will you guard the faith, order, liturgy, doctrine, and discipline of the church against all that is contrary to God's word? So he vowed whenever he became, you know, every, every pastor who gets ordained in the United Methodist Church says that they have read our discipline and they find it in harmony with, with the Scriptures. Here, he, he understands that part of his job is defending the Book of Discipline. It's our covenant document. It's the only binding document for the whole denomination. And here, he's, he's uncharitably uh, characterizing it and, and inferring that we should not be bound to the Book of Discipline. Rather, we should be bound to the beloved community. So he points to the beloved community several times and says that's what we need to be doing. And then all throughout, we have this awful contingency over here that they're not interested in that. They're not interested in the beloved community, and we need to have a new conversation, not the one they're wanting to have about broken covenants and being bound to this book of discipline and all these rules. What's with all these rules? That's a Dave Chappelle reference if you don't know it. Um, He doesn't want us talking about that. He wants us talking about the beloved community. So forget about the doctrines established within our discipline. I I don't think he would say that. I'm being hyperbolic here. But but, uh, what he would say is the beloved community should be our orienting point, not necessarily what's in the book of discipline. And the problem is the role of bishop is to defend the discipline. So one of the things that conservatives have been very concerned about is what do we do when those in charge of defending the discipline don't even like the discipline when they're on camera railing against the discipline. That's a problem, is it not? That's part of why we find ourselves where we are, but Bishop Bickerton wouldn't want us to talk about that. He wants us to talk about unity. He wants us to talk about mission. And so um, I, would, I also wanted to point out the, the thing that I was particularly concerned about here. I, I, I did a an interview with the gentleman who complained, filed a complaint against Bishop Olivito. Olivito. And um, you should see it. I published it like two weeks ago. His name was Rob. Last name is escaping me. I'm sorry. But one of the things he he noted was they dismissed his complaint saying that Bishop Olivito's words, which were not Trinitarian, 
which were anti-Trinitarian, were against the divinity of Christ Jesus, that they reflected newer understandings of United Methodist theology. And the problem is, nowhere in our Book of Discipline is her doctrine expressed. So the thing I lifted up in that interview is, it sounds to me as though there are doctrinal standards outside of the Book of Discipline that are being acknowledged as valid and even superior by our leadership in the denomination. And I think that might be what Bickerton is doing, Bishop Bickerton is doing with the beloved community. I find that very concerning. So here's another thing that he does. He starts making the case that the church is mirroring or mimicking the culture around us. And um, here's, here's him making that case. The real problem is that we've stopped talking with one another and instead are only talking at one another. I couldn't agree more. We have digressed into the my way or highway mentality where if you don't agree with my opinion or my position, you're just wrong. These very same polarizing attitudes and cultural shifts have found their way right in the midst of our beloved church. Our church looks more like the culture than the culture looks like the church. So someone like me would completely agree with that. The problem is I, I hear all that and go, um, you're the one doing that. <laughs> As we're talking about people who are not talking with one another, they're talking at one another. That's exactly what I think this presentation is. I, I've said that in so many words so far, but when you're not doing the Rogerian thing, when you're not steel manning your, oppo your opponent's argument, when you're straw manning them and then mischaracterizing them and demonizing them, then that's what you're doing. You're mirroring the partisan divide that we're seeing in our country right now. And so the answer is not to lean into that more, but to take a step back and say, okay, how can I turn down the temperature here? How can I validate my opponents where they might be right or where there might be some wiggle room here? And you would get the impression from him that he really doesn't think there is any wiggle room, that there is any legitimacy, and that the, the people on the other side really are just these divisive people mirroring the partisan divide that we see in Washington, D.C. And I just think that's a really, um, I've said the word uncharitable, disingenuous way of, of interpreting people. These, these are real people. You know, we've established that Bishop Bickerton is a real person, but people on the other side are real people too, who love their kids, who love their church, who love the heritage of their church, who love Jesus Christ. We just genuinely understand and see things very differently. And it's not because we're just bent on destruction. It's because there are real differences. There are real significant differences that have been percolating and bubbling up to the surface and causing all kinds of tragedy for, for decades. And we have to reckon with that. Uh, the, well, the only alternative is uh, denial and avoidance. And that is not what bishops are here to do. That's not what, what any leaders are here to do. And so it's distressing to me that, that there doesn't seem to be self-awareness on his part as he's saying these things, how easily someone from the other side can fit him into the box that he's just constructed of, of people. You know, as, as I look at Bishop Bickerton and a lot of the bishops, as I see the statements that they put out together, as I see the things they respond to, the, you know, did you notice how whenever in Washington, D.C., and on left-wing media outlets, they start talking about misinformation. All of a sudden, all of the bishops are very concerned about misinformation. You know, I see all these signals, you know, when you look at the, the language of the jurisdictional conference legislation, which I did a series on, there are so many indicators that a huge contingent of our denomination is walking in lockstep with the Democratic Party. So, I yes, I see the partisan divide, but whenever we're talking about which group is more prone to, uh, to hold to uh, a worldly body, a worldly partisan uh, thing. The conservatives are the ones that go independent and say, hey, I, I don't have a dog in this fight, I'm leaving. It's the liberals who walk in lockstep generally with the Democratic Party, and that's, that's a problem, you know? Um, or it's a problem whenever we're acting like conservatives are doing it, but liberals don't. That's just a weird position to take. Um, I don't know that I have anything more to say about that. The, the final thing was an exhortation to unity, um, and so uh, this, was, this was near the end of his presentation. Um, here we go. 
If we are united, we are strong. But if we're divided, we will destroy ourselves, kill the work of God we've been called to, and do irreparable harm to vulnerable souls. So this is, this is what essentially he, does. he talks about the, the mission of the church and how we need to be united in mission. And yeah, united is a key core word there. We have to be united. Otherwise, there is irreversible harm that's going to be done, and you don't want to cause harm, do you? So it's kind of this, um, I mean, the hyperbolic way of talking about it would be that liberals have been holding conservatives hostage for some time by saying, if you leave, if you stop giving, if you, if you tear this apart, then all of this good work that's being done is not going to be done anymore. And in conservatives, that's really hurt a lot of us. We don't want good work to stop being done, but also we don't want people who hate us taking the levers of power, taking our money and using it against us, and speaking evil of us in the meantime. That's, that's dysfunctional and wrong as well. And so conservatives that are leaving are saying, we need to continue giving to UMCOR, we need to build our own mission uh, we, in fact, even need to step up global mission if we're going to be a global Methodist church so that uh, nobody is left hurting from the division that is happening in the denomination. So the, it's not as though the United Methodist Church is the only outfit that can do good work or that's doing amazing mission. Um, there are a lot of bodies already present that do amazing work, and it's not a foregone conclusion that conservatives aren't going to do good work. I just think it's a false decision between unity and good work and division and good work. Um, I just don't think it's a it's a, a genuine point. And then the other thing, and I, I could have highlighted another post, but I didn't. He he spends some time and energy saying we gotta get back to to our foundational roots. We gotta get back to mission. We've got to get back to a clarity of of an others focused ministry. And the thing is I think, one, it's not like people haven't been trying for decades. You know, it's not like we've just been sitting and letting division happen. I, you know, I'm I'm relatively young, and I've seen push after push for unity, for collaboration, for mission. And the thing is that that rings hollow whenever it's not bound together by the true gospel, a shared understanding of what that is. You know, our mission is to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. What's a disciple? Tell me the hallmarks of a disciple. We can't agree on this. How are we trying to transform the world? We can't agree on that. These are just words that we use the same words. We mean something very differently by them. You know, you use that word coercion. I'm not sure you and I mean the same thing by it. You use the the word conversion. I'm not sure you mean the same thing as I do when I use it. We speak about loving Jesus. I'm not sure you're talking about the same Jesus I am. You know, let's spend some time on that. And then if it turns out we are talking about different things using the same words, are we going to continue to fight over who's got the right definition, or are we going to allow others to part ways amicably? The other part of that is the language of going back. I think it's too late. We've already allowed a huge infrastructure to be built on things that are not in conformity with where we began Um, up until 50 years ago. Any Methodist that came before would not recognize liberals in the United Methodist Church as legitimate Methodists. They would say that you're antinomianism, that you're antinomian, that that you're um, calling evil good and 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 good evil. Um, And that's not to say that is how things actually are. That's just to say when you're talking about going back, you're talking about going back to an era where people had discernment that led them to conclude that the direction that the United Methodist Church is going right now is not acceptable. Um, I'm speaking in generalizations, not in every... I'm not saying every single particular Methodist that came before would say that. I'm saying that generally speaking, there is no way that the church beyond 50 years ago would have ever been comfortable imagining going the direction we're going now. And the vast majority, 99% probably, of the church at that time would totally understand conservatives wanting to get out at this point. We've, we've really lost our moorings. The denomination, it's become something else. It's like we started off playing football. Halfway through the game, somebody started playing soccer, and more and more people have just started playing soccer. You can't play soccer and football at the same time. It doesn't matter if you're calling both balls the ball. It doesn't matter if you're calling the field the field. 
you can have the same words being doing completely different things. So I could talk forever about that. I wanted to end on this quote by J.C. Ryle, who, of course, was not a Methodist. But, you know, we're, while we're talking about non-Methodist thinkers, let's go ahead and do this. Peace without truth is a false peace. It is the very peace of the devil. Unity without the gospel is a worthless unity. It is the very unity of hell. We ought to contend jealously for the truth and to fear the loss of truth more than the loss of peace. To maintain pure truth in the church, we should be ready to make any sacrifice to hazard peace, to risk dissension, and run the chance of division. Never let us be guilty of sacrificing any portion of truth on the altar of peace. We should no more tolerate false doctrine than we should tolerate sin. To regularly hear unscriptural teaching is a serious thing. It is a continual dropping of slow poison into the mind. Let us receive nothing, believe nothing, follow nothing which is not in the Bible, nor can be proved by the Bible. And of course, that's where this whole division is. And there's nothing I can say that's going to convince people on the left. And there's nothing people on the left can say so far that's going to dissuade me. That doesn't mean I'm not listening. That doesn't mean I don't want to be in conversation. But that just means for decades we've known that the difference is in uh, biblical interpretation. And we these were things that we said out loud and we're all in agreement wa- with until the moment of division came. And then, no, we're backing off. No, we need unity. No... These, these people wanting division are not legitimate. This is not real stuff. It's misinformation. They're, they're, being, they're, be, they're just wrong. You know? And I just think that that, is, that approach is wrong. It's wrong-headed. It's leading us in the wrong direction. I think we need firm leadership that can acknowledge the differences between us, that they're real, that, that we ran this experiment as the United Methodist Church as a big tent, and it hasn't gone well. You know, we, we start off with good intentions, and we can be forgiven for being op- overly naive. This cultural moment finally exposes it's, it's untenable. So um, even if you don't agree with me on that, just to be able to acknowledge that intelligent, conscientious, loving people can say that, and they're not these demons bent on division, would go a long way towards cooling things down a bit. So I don't know. My hope in recording this is that... Um, I would like for people who are having these conversations to do it better. I would like for our bishops to consider my words and whether or not they can be more charitable in their understandings of evangelical conservatives. If they are spreading misinformation or uh, caricaturing liberals, I think it's good to call that out and 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 say, hey, you know, you don't have to say things this way. We don't have to to be nasty like this. But if the reality is just that people are having a conversation we'd rather not them have, I don't think we get to say it's time to have a new conversation. Let's let people get where they belong with their covenant bodies, and then that's when a new conversation can begin. That's when a new song can be sung. Let's pray for a day where we can do that amicably. All right, that'll, that'll close my time out. I appreciate any time you spent with me. If you think it's useful, pass it along to somebody else. Um, God bless you.